you are listening to the Christian Music Archive Podcast, part of the New Release Today Podcast Network. I'm your host, Dave Maurer. Each week, I share stories about Christ, community, and music, chatting with musical guests who you will find listed on the pages of the Christian Music Archive. There are thousands of creative men and women who have helped shape the soundtrack of the Christian faith, and we get to hear their stories, learn about how Christ has made a difference in their life, and hopefully along the way, we'll learn how we can be a better part of our community. I've been thinking a lot about encouragement lately, partially because I've been appreciative of people who have been encouraging to me but also because I've been seeing the need for people to be encouraged around me. At church, we have been working through the book of Ephesians, and our pastor wrapped up the series this week looking at the last four verses of chapter 6. Paul is sending his handwritten note to the Ephesians via a courier named Tychicus, and he says, I am sending him to you to let you know how we are doing and to encourage you. Tychicus was an encourager. In fact, he accompanied Paul on some of his missionary journeys, and he also acted as the delivery person for Paul's letter to the Colossians. For most of my life, I've been a behind-the-scenes kind of guy. My goal, even as a kid, was to help people be the best version of themselves, to, to help them succeed. And in my day job now, I am a trainer, trying to help businesses succeed and be better at their craft. I am an encouragement, currently, to business owners. Now, I'm a firm believer in the importance of encouragement. In fact, when I was going through my divorce more than 20 years ago, there were two people who helped me through that very dark time by encouraging me. And maybe that's how I learned the really importance of encouragement. Steve just made sure that I always had things to do so I wasn't wallowing in my thoughts at home alone every night. Pam, well, she made sure that she always came up to me at church, giving me a big hug and letting me know that she was praying for me. The reason I'm bringing all of this up is because I see our society today in desperate need of encouragement. Our friends, co-workers, and family members are coming out of a really tough year. 2020 was a tough one for all of us. There is so much division and finger-pointing and opposite thoughts about what is right these days that we are hurting and in need of someone to offer encouragement. Our conversation today is with Eric Campuzano of The Prayer Chain, and this conversation also illustrates the importance of encouragement. Here was a young band trying to make a difference, and they were really struggling because of the differences between them, the expectations of their record label, and even finger-pointing by fellow Christians. But Eric talks about how important it was for them to receive encouragement from people while they were going through these tough times. And even today, they still get encouragement from fans who say, what you did made a difference in my life. So I guess the theme of this podcast today is encouragement. We all need to receive it, and I think we all need to give it out. According to the World Health Organization, over 750 million people do not have access to clean water. In South Asia, where Mercy Inc. is working, the water that is available is contaminated with arsenic, making it a poisonous concoction that causes people to get sick and sometimes die. So Mercy Inc. and their partners are drilling deep wells to make sure that there's safe, clean water available to the community. Many of these wells are installed in mostly Muslim villages. The wells are painted blue and have the name Jesus Wells emblazoned on them, and they really stand out. As the wells are installed and maintained, the message of Jesus is being shared and people are learning about the living water of Christ as they receive the clean water that they need for life, health, and safety. According to Mercy Inc.'s statistics, nearly 300 people make a personal decision for Christ at each of these wells. Would you like to learn more about the Jesus Wells Project? Head over to christianmusicarchive.com mercy and you can help provide living water in addition to clean, safe drinking water. The Prayer Chain was an alternative rock band in the early 90s, making thought-provoking, grunge-sounding music about the same time that Nirvana was also pioneering this new type of rock. Throughout the 90s, the band released several albums, but like so many bands, they started to struggle with differences of direction, not only with the record label, but also between their members. 
I recently got to talk with Eric Campuzano, bass player for The Prayer Chain, and we get to hear the whole band's story. So let's jump in and help me welcome to the podcast, Eric Campuzano. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So let's let's kind of get started. Uh, how did The Prayer Chain start? Now, I know that you were in a band, and um, I think there was a couple of bands that kind of broke up at one time, and you guys kind of came together as a group. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so me and Andy Prickett, the guitar player from the prayer chain, we were in a band together called Laughing Boy. And Tim Tabor, which I knew from youth group back in high school, um, he had his own band called Tapestry. And sort of like, at the same time, they sort of broke up. And since I knew Tim from youth group, I asked him, because he's a singer, mm -hmm. me and Andy can't sing, and said, hey, do you want to start writing songs together? And, you know, so we, that's how it started. And Tim was also a drummer. Mm. And at the time, we didn't have a drummer. And so, like, Tim, you know, did all the demos on drums, and, like, we rehearsed with him on drums doing vocals. And, you know, that's how it started, just very, very innocent, you know. Kind of the Phil Collins style where he's buying the drums and singing lead. Yeah. Well, so then you released your first album. You guys uh, released an indie project with uh, Steve Hindelong producing, right? From the choir? Yeah. Um, back in the day, we used to play clubs. Mm -hmm. We open up for, uh, I think, the choir. Anyways, Andy Prickett and Dan Michaels made a connection, you know, and Andy started working on Dan Michaels' solo project. Mm -hmm. And that's how we got into the graces of Derry and Steve. Yeah. And Steve was broke and wanted money. <laughs> and we had some money and said, I'll make a demo for you. And so that's how it started. Well, and then you've worked with Steve for quite a while. Cause I was just literally before this interview, I was watching your 2018 house of blues in Anaheim show and who's mm -hmm. playing percussion in the back, but there's Steve pounding on yeah. the drums. <laughs> you no, know, I think, Steve secretly loves us and hates us all at the same time. Uh -oh. You know, it's a very love-hate relationship. Why do you say that? Well, because, like, I think originally he only took us on as a band because we were paying him to produce our demo. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, you know, we became friends, and we had, like, this really great synergy with, with each other. Yeah. It's like any relationship. It takes a long time to, like, you know, feel everything out. And, you know, there's a lot of funny stories. And, uh, but yeah, he's, he was very important to the prayer chain, was very nurturing and very encouraging. You know, once we got past repaying him as a, <laughs> a producer, and all of a sudden he became a producer, friend, mentor, and, you know, very encouraging, you know, uh, person in our, in our musical lives. Yeah, and it helps to have, especially when you're starting out. I mean, you guys had had bands before, but starting out having somebody who's kind of been through the school of hard knocks isn't a bad thing to have in your pack. Correct. He was a mentor and a friend, and I love him to this day. We all do. I mean, that's why he's up on stage, you know, with us, because that's how much he meant to us. Well, you guys kind of paved the way for a kind of CCM alternative, alternative grunge, that kind of feel. I mean, we had a lot of underground bands like the 77s and Mike Rowe and some of these folks that that were doing music like this, and even the choir, but they weren't kind of mainstream like you guys were. You guys kind of paved the way for that 90s alternative scene in the Christian music. I guess. I mean, I we did, and it was just, I think, just everything really worked out for the prayer chain. Our original demo did really, really well, blew up on radio. We got signed to... Um, quote, a major Christian label, you know, and they, we had more opportunities than other bands. Like, I mean, the choir was on MERS, so like they were already mm -hmm. in that thing, but obviously our music was more rock and roll where there was more ethereal. And I think it just tapped into like this weird moment when rock and roll was blowing up. Right. We got lucky because I, I know for a fact we weren't the best band. I think we had a lot of luck, but we worked very, very hard. <laughs> we worked our asses off. Well, and that showed because you you developed this huge kind of underground following that or cult following, if you will, that kind of parlayed beyond when the end of your record deal came along. So, I mean, that kind of shows the integrity of your work ethic. For sure. Even when we were like starting off, we played every single show. 
any place. There'd be one person, a hundred people, you know, all the time, seven days a week, all the time. And that's what we did. We, for the prayer chain, we decided, you know what we're going to do? We might not be the best band, but we're going to work mm. harder than all the other bands. We're just going to outwork everyone. And so we took every show, every opportunity, and just kept going and going and going, you know? So, like, even though, like, sometimes, like, big doors were open, but to get there, we mm. had to open all the tiny ones and sometimes <laughs> kick them through, yeah, you know? Yeah, Well, and you had, what was it called? Uh, the, the five million mile tour or something like that? Oh, the 56 million mile tour. 56 million, yeah. <laughs> and you guys probably felt like you traveled yep. that much because you were doing most of that in a van, right? Yeah, that was from the Mercury <laughs> record. That's one of the lyrics. Yeah, I mean, we we toured all the time and just never stopped playing. So you got the deal with the record label, and you released Shawl in 93. Yep. And then you were called upon to do, as every band is, to do another record. And and that was kind of a journey for you guys. Because there was like a, 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 you didn't quite see eye to eye. The record label didn't see what you were doing, so forth. Yep. What was that like? It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, we'd been on the road, you know, because we started touring on uh, the Whirlpool EP, mm-hmm. and then we bumped into uh, the Shawl EP. Right. And uh, we had one more record that we owed Reunion, mm-hmm. and they were gracious enough to put it out for us. But I remember in Southern California, we had to do a New Year's Eve concert. And we had to have a band meeting and it was just like, we all knew we're breaking up. Hmm. Like the band was sort of like just done. Yeah. We didn't get along, but we owed reunion one more record and we wanted to honor that contract. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we really wanted to do, you know, something that we wanted to do. Yeah. Like it's very selfish. And um, because reunion wanted us to be a Petra type band. Mm. They were expecting us to do certain things that I don't think we were capable of ever. Mm. And, you know, because I, our first two singles off of Whirlpool and um, Shine and I Believe, which we know are Christian anthems. Mm -hmm. And they were really fun and it it totally opened doors for us. And we, you know, it was, it was great. And then on Saul, we said Shine is dead. Mm. We sort of, we just decided like, okay, we're, we're going this direction. And then, like, I think, I think Reunion probably could have lived with Shawl Part Two. Okay. And a couple of guys in the band would probably be fine with that because that's when grunge was blowing up. Right. And we decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do, we have one more record. We're going to take all the advantages that Reunion has given us financially and Steve Hinnemong mm-hmm. and just use all of our resources to make the record that we want to make. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we did. You know, and it was very, um, very fun and, and very, very difficult, you know, because it, it, it took a lot to get along with with every one of the men. Like there were great weeks, bad weeks, bad days. It, you know, just it, it's hard. Oh, living 365 days in a van, eating, yeah. you know, McDonald's every day. You see the best and the worst of people very, very quickly. I mean, it's it's sometimes more involved than a marriage. <laughs> yeah. No, it, no, no, it is. It's just like people always ask me all the time, like, would you ever change it? I'm like, no. Mm. And then also at the same time, like, hell yes, please. <laughs> you know? And I'm sure all the fellows in the band would agree with that. I mean, I had so many great times and got to see so many great places and meet so many great uh, fans and make new friends. Even to this day, like, I, I still have friends all over the globe, mm-hmm. you know, that I, that I have relationships with. And it's just like, wow. I mean, it's a blessing. Well, without going too much into band dynamics, cause I don't want to, you know, get into that. He said, she said kind of a thing, but do you think part of the tension was that you guys were breaking ground in a genre that really wasn't ready for you? And uh, you know, like the mainstream alternative wasn't there yet when you guys were, I mean, like when Shaw came out, it, it raised a lot, <laughs> a lot of eyebrows of what's this? you know, from a Christian's per- perspective. Now, obviously not in the mainstream, but did that play a part in the dis- yeah. dysfunction between the group or? Um, possibly because you have four four different fellows with four different beliefs 
Mm. And, it, you know, it's, it's hard to, I mean, that's why we have so many denominations, right. you know, Christianity. <laughs> yeah. And so like the band, there's four different denominations, mm. you know? Yeah. I mean, there, there, there were some different expectations from different guys in the group about like how evangelical we want to be. Mm. Cause what we started doing at the end is like, we decided like when we're doing the like last couple tours of Mercury, like we decided we, we don't want to play in the church anymore. That meant like the chapels, mm -hmm. you know, that thing, because we felt like that was God's place. Mm -hmm. Like we don't need to be in there. Like that's, that's where you go and worship. And like, we were fine playing like in the fireside room. Mm -hmm. We just didn't want to be in the chapel. So that was somewhat controversial and it was difficult to navigate. And sometimes we had to make compromises and sometimes the church or the, you know, the person that was booking us was, you know, making compromises, but it was like that, that whole dynamic where like, we didn't feel like we were like an undercover band where we can go out there and, you know, do altar calls and do, you know, those special things, you know, like the altar boys did. Mm -hmm. We don't, we just felt like we were just a band. We had a message. It was generally based in Christ. And, you know, we all were Christians. We all love God. But it just felt like we, there's expectations put on us. Like we couldn't do that. Mm. You know, like a bunch of times, you know, we get asked to do altar calls. It's like, man, I'm 22 years old. Like, you know, like, <laughs> I, I, no, I can't do that. I mean, we tried doing it. And like after like the third time, we're like, this is terrible. Like, you know, reading the Bible and trying to explain it to someone is different than reading the Bible and you understanding how it means to you. Mm -hmm. And we decided like early on that we weren't an evangelical band in the strictest sense. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because one of the tensions that we've seen in Christian music in the last decade or so is the worship music versus other stuff. Yeah. And it, it's it's that vertical versus horizontal conversation. Yeah. And I think a lot of times, especially in the in the Christian music industry, they have a a record of what works in sales. And obviously these these record companies are in the business to make money, right? Absolutely. And, yeah. and so so if they if they try it's like um, you know, if you're if you're a pet store and you sell if if you sell fish, having a dog is still a pet, but if you're a fish store, you can't sell dogs. You know, yeah. so they're going to try to make that dog a fish. So they call it a dog fish. Well, whatever, you know, but, but yeah. we, we try to pigeonhole a lot of our artists into these categories because we know that's what sells. That's what our constituents buy. And if you don't fit into that, we're going to try to bend you and fit you into that so that we can sell and make our money back. Correct. And, and I think I've often wondered if you guys had played 10, 15 years later, if that would have been the issue it was then, because I feel like you guys were such groundbreaking on the edge of that mainstream alternative music that if you were 20 years later, 10 years later, that it might not have been as big of a deal. I would agree with that. We were caught right in that weird time where you're still expected to be evangelical, mm -hmm. quote, a, you know, worship band. Yeah. And we weren't. I know that we've made some songs that people love to worship to, which I'm totally stoked on. Yeah. But it was just, there were too many cooks in the kitchen that expected different sauces, different, <laughs> you, know, you know, just different, different expectations when you're just yeah. like, all I got is this hamburger. And they're like, well, we need, you know, cheese on that. And then the other guy's like, well, I don't want the cheese. I want, you know, the grilled, you know, onions, you know, and which is fine. Yeah. But, you know, it, it was really hard and very difficult for us because we felt called to God and we wanted to honor God and, and his calling. But at the same time, it was just like, we're not fitting into your niches. Mm -hmm. And I always thought, and I'm actually like kind of relieved today, is that Christian music should have always been just worship music. Mm. You know what I mean? Because you can't, I mean, are the 77s just like Sandy Patty? No. <laughs> right. You know, right. yes, to answer your question, yes, <laughs> it, it, it was hard. You know, one of the things I often, I, I lament is the fact that we have Christian music at all. We don't have Christian plumbers. Nope. We don't have Christian truck drivers. 
we don't have Christian accountants. Oh, I mean, we have Christians who are truck drivers, who are plumbers, who are accountants, but we don't call it Christian accounting. Yeah. You know, and music, I can understand an evangelist. I get that. But music is an expression of what we are inside. And if what we are inside is colored by our relationship with God, it's going to come out in a more positive spin than somebody who doesn't have that relationship. Yeah. But then to brand it all as, and say, okay, this is because you're Christians, you have to make evangelical music. Yeah. I, that I Yeah. I, I totally hear where you're coming from. I totally hear that. So going back to the point about Christian music, you know, we still get notes and letters today about how, because the prayer chain was in the industry, that it really helped kids with their faith and really helped them see like what they're struggling with. Like they're not alone. It's not always like, praise God. It's just like, I'm scared. I'm afraid. Yeah. I'm insecure. I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. And I think that's what made the prayer chain somewhat successful in, in Christian music was that we attacked and addressed a lot of those issues, which the kids at the time that now are adults identified with. Mm -hmm. And so like our struggles were their struggles. They got it. They understood it. And so like in a weird way, having the prayer chain in Christian music allowed a lot of kids to take their insecurity and feel a little bit more secure about mm -hmm. their faith, about who they are and their struggles, because there is someone else out there that's telling them like, got to, we're, we're having the same struggles. Yeah. And so like, that's what I find the most empowering about the prayer chain is like, we had that opportunity to not break down any walls because that's hyperbole. It's just like, I think we had an opportunity to just reach a bunch of kids that really needed to know that you're not alone. Christ still loves you, even though you're going through this, this, and this. And, you know, you have the opportunity now to feel yeah. more secure and make your own decisions. Yeah. So that's a very long answer. Sorry, I got big. Well, well, not at all, because I think uh, there's a lot of people that will never darken the door of a church because they don't feel comfortable. But for us to come alongside people in relationship— and, and be that person's friend and then be able to come and say, hey, by the way, this is something that I'm wrestling with. This is something that I'm dealing with. And this is the solution I found. People are going to be more open than that than to say, hey, you want to come with me to church on Sunday? <laughs> yeah. And so it's that relationship. It's that community that we're, that we're all trying to be in that I think is more effective. And I, and I think what you guys offered as uh, the prayer chain was that I won't say for the first time, because this, I think the Jesus movement in the 70s did kind of the same thing of, hey, we can speak your language and show you that Jesus is part of the, in your language. But we got this industry behind us that says, okay, now we have this industry, we have to make it churchy. Yeah, that's reasonable. You know, if the choir were doing it before us in the 77s were as well, it's fantastic. And it's been, a, you know, like I told you, I'm sorry if I'm being redundant, it's, it's a blessing to hear from people emailing us and texting us and just saying how much things meant to them and how it, how it helped them. Mm -hmm. And it's just an honor, you know, to be honest. And I've, you know, I don't know how to explain it. Like I'm blessed to be in these people's lives, even though like, I don't know them and mm -hmm. you know, I'm very grateful and thankful for them. And I'm thankful for everyone that listened to our music and, you know, enjoyed it and liked it. Like I, yeah. I don't, I don't take it for granted. It's, you know, it's, that's, that's why I'm doing these things. So to tell everyone, thank you. You guys meant as much to us as we meant to you because, like like I said, we've made great friends. I didn't expect this when I, when I was 17. Well, what did your experience in the prayer chain and the highs and lows of that, how did that affect you now as you look back on that 20 years later, and how does that change who you are today? Well, I'm more broke today than I was back then. Um, so, no, well, it's the, it's the same thing I just said. When we were on tour, this was back before email and the, the internet and whatever. <laughs> so we get fan mail. Yeah. And so on tour, we make these postcards. And so, you know, you're driving to city to city. We take all of our fan mail and we respond to them handwritten 
on these postcards and you know we get the post office to drop them off post you know drop them off i'm not kidding even today like whatever it's been like 25 30 years now yeah people say you know like it, now we get emails that'll say like oh man he sent me this postcard that meant so much and so i think that's the weird connection that prayer chain have like we worked as hard as we could to like always be connecting with the audience even you know like just writing a postcard like thank you for the, your letter you know we appreciate it and send it out you know so i guess nothing's changed but like you feel more love now and more appreciated and mm. then reciprocal as well more love and appreciated by them yeah like we did those uh those last few shows and Nashville and Southern California, you know, for the uh, re-release of Shawl. Mm -hmm. And it was just like that. It was just like seeing so many friends and it, it, it made people happy. And I'm, I'm very happy to make people happy. I think it's, people need more happiness in their lives. And yeah, I mean, it was hard work and it took a lot of time, a lot of energy, but like yeah. at the end of the day, man, it was totally worth it. They, it was great. Well, I'm going to put a link in the show notes to the YouTube video that's up there for the House of Blues in Anaheim. If you if you haven't seen that, guys, it is an amazing show, and the sonically, it's a beautiful and well shot, and a great memory uh, of the Shawl album and some of the other stuff that was down. Uh, a really, really cool show. So, the work and effort you put in for that too was really well worth it. So, I want to thank you for that. Oh, thank you very much. So what is, uh, what's up with the band in the days since uh, the you guys were a full-time band? Uh, you and I spoke a little bit earlier. You're driving truck right now. Um, what what does that look like for you? What's what's your life these days look like? Well, uh, since the prayer chain, I've, I've been in Starflyer 59. Okay. Me, Andy, and uh, Wayne put out all those Kush records. I don't know if okay. You're... I'd forgotten about the Kush records. Yeah. yeah. So we did all that. Um, I've been putting out, uh, this other band I've been playing with called Stranger Kings. I put out a bunch of those records. So I'm still doing music, but I'm, but I'm at home and, uh, you know, just, it's, 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 it's one of those weird vices that I just can't get rid of. <laughs> I, I, I prefer to get rid of the music because it's, it's expensive and it takes a lot of time and there's yeah. not a lot of rewards. Yeah, yeah. You know, but every now and then, that's the thing. Like, you write a song or you write a melody or you write a part, and you're just like, oh, so good. <laughs> it sounds kind of creepy right now. But, but yeah, I mean, it's it just it just keeps on keeping on. Are you familiar with the Lassie Foundation? I've heard of it, but tell us a little bit about it. Well, that, that was right after the prayer chain. Uh, that's me and Wayne Everett, the drummer. Mm -hmm. And so we put out uh, a bunch of records for the Lassie Foundation. So we did that. Another band is called Charity Impressa. And uh, so right now, like Lassie Foundation is re-releasing the original record. Okay. And, um, and I'm actually working on it, the last record for Charity Impressa. And uh, so Tim, he has a production company that puts on concerts, super successful, does it all over the world. Hmm. He just opened up a restaurant in Costa Mesa, California. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, so he's doing good. Uh, and he's doing good, the guitar player. Mm -hmm. uh, he's put out, uh, so from the prayer chain, my brother's mother, he was in the Violet Burning. Um, obviously, we did Kush. And then, you know, he has a couple other things. Um cooking out there that's always available so we're, we're we're all busy you know still doing music and still hanging on to our relationships mm -hmm. so you know but yeah the last decade has repaired a lot of a lot of the uh animosity and anger and you know generally we get along you know <laughs> well we say that about our siblings too right there's days we don't get along with our siblings yep. so. yeah yeah. Well, I think I think the important thing to to take away from this, at least as far as I'm seeing, is we've listed a number of great bands that have come 
maybe not as a result of what you guys have done, but you guys have spawned a ton of great alternative bands in the quote unquote Christian industry that are out there. Um, and I, I'd forgotten about Kush. I, you know, and um, it, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing to see how kind of that progression goes along and, and trickles out. And, and like you say, you can't stop a musician from writing music. So he's got to have an outlet. <laughs> yeah. I, I wish there was a way because I, <laughs> probably be a lot more happier <laughs> it's hard like i feel really bad for my wife because like you know i'm like uh i'm gonna go to the studio she's like okay <laughs> i'm like i'm sorry she's like just go <laughs> just go make your music <laughs> yeah because i do feel guilty you know sometimes because of that you know because like the amount of time i've taken away from my family and my friends to pursue this career is a lot. I feel like I didn't have to make any sacrifices, but they did, you know. Mm. You know, I've missed weddings, I've missed funerals, I've missed these events because I'm out on the road touring. Yeah. And it's just, you know, the sacrifice you make, I'm not trying to be a martyr. It's just, you know, it takes a toll. If we have a young and up-and-coming band that's listening to this podcast, and you're looking back over your time, what advice would you give them that you would A, either do differently, or B, that you wouldn't have done any differently, you would have done it just like you did? My advice to any band listening to this is run it as a business. Everyone in the band should have their role. Everyone should know like what their expectations are. So just like a business, like, and like if there's like a guy in the band that's like the best songwriter, then let's, let's listen to him a little bit more. If there's another guy in the band that can run like the business side, let's listen to him on the business. Like you can't just always be like crushing each other because nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. And I know it's counterintuitive because like, oh no, this is art. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's only art until someone gives you a, a recording contract and now <laughs> it's business. Yeah. If you want to do art, then do it and put it out by yourself. Mm -hmm. If you want to do it as a business and like really ramp it up, then you got to run it as a business. And I heard somebody say, you know, art is art until somebody pays for it. And then it's like you said, it's that, it's that transaction. And so if you're selling your CDs, it's now a business. You have to have enough money to be able to go to the studio, to record the product, to put it out, to manufacture it. And if you're just giving it away, you're not going to be making money at it. That's fine. That's art. But you've yeah. got to make sure that you're taking care of, of the bottom line. And then they, also you can't be mad at the record label or the person that's giving you money that wants to have input. It's just like, we just made a transaction. That transaction means now they're involved. Now you have input. If you don't want that, just don't do it. Mm -hmm. And don't blame them because you took the money. So what what has God been teaching you these these last few weeks, months, days, years? I know the last year of 2020 has kind of put us all into kind of a weird tailspin, but where's where's God been leading you and teaching you these last little bit? All right, this is sound like a, a cop out. My faith is very personal to me. Mm -hmm. I want to let everyone know that I am still a believer. I believe in Jesus Christ and I am saved by his grace and thankful every day for his grace. Mm -hmm. And I am so lucky when I was a sophomore in high school to find God. And this journey is still, still going. I'm just thankful for, for Christ and, and my friends, believers and non-believers that mm -hmm. uh, respect my faith and I respect whatever they have going on and uh, so it's always been difficult for me to talk about christianity especially after our experiences with the prayer chain because a lot of people told us we weren't christians accused of random things mm -hmm. and so i fought against the church for a long time and i i, I still have difficulties with the church but like i don't have difficulties with Christ. The last, you know, decade has been tough on me and my family and, you know, we're still here, we're still praying, still believing. One of the things that I'm very aware of is that I believe, and I say this 
with all caution and respect, we as a church have done a poor job of being Christ followers. And we attack our own where we should be attacking the devil. And I know of a lot of people who've been very, very, very hurt because of the church, which is supposed to be the body of Christ. And and one of the things that I've wrestled with over and over again is how is it that the God of the universe would choose to work through people as messed up as we are, <laughs> you know? Yeah, true, yeah. But I'm also very grateful that God reaches us exactly where we are, and we don't have to cross the threshold of the church to be considered God's kid. Yeah. Because once we say, Lord, I'm going to make you Lord of my life, I'm going to submit to you— that's really what makes us a Christian. It's like, I think Keith Green said it, going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, uh, and going to church doesn't make you a Christian. It's how you live out your relationship with Jesus, how you, how you live that with your friends, how you prioritize what God is in your life. That's what makes you a Christian. And I think that we as a society would do very much better if we would focus on the fact that we need to live more like Christ instead of hurting our own. And then also hurting the people that God's reaching for. I understand that. I agree with all of that. I just also want to say, like, I don't blame the church for how I feel now. Like, that, this is my decision. These were my experiences. And I, I do definitely want to encourage anyone to go to church. Church is great. And while I have my own hiccups with the church the church is not evil it's it's broken like man and mm -hmm. man is running the church so like you just have to sort of navigate your way through it at the end of the day if you love your church awesome it's mm -hmm. great and uh more people went to church you know that'd probably be a better thing and if our churches were run better and just mm -hmm. talked the bible in christ the church would be even more better mm -hmm. as opposed to all these weird things they all have cooking, you know, in their church. Well, Eric, I end every conversation. Uh, we send out a prayer newsletter every Saturday asking folks to pray for, for people who have made music, people who are making music and for the work that they're doing. How can we be praying specifically for you in the weeks and months coming up? Well, can you ask them to have God make me be able to sing in tune? <laughs> you mean you don't want to use auto-tune? <laughs> no. <laughs> I would say, uh, I guess when I, I want to turn my prayer back to all those people. Tell them I will pray for them as well. I just tell them that I'm thankful and grateful just for the opportunity and uh I will keep them in my prayers and they can keep me in their prayers and I got no prayer requests other than like, thank you. As someone who recognizes the importance of encouragement and community, this conversation with Eric was a bittersweet chat for me. On the one hand, I'm devastated that the church and the Christian music industry were not able to see past their differences and actually encourage the guys in prayer chain. But I'm also grateful for the fans and the way they encouraged the band through that difficult time, and in fact, even encouraged them today. What really struck me is that Eric several times mentioned how grateful he was for the fans and for the support they gave. It's obvious that encouragement went a long way, even into today, more than 20 years after the band broke up. There are lots of encouragement verses in the Bible, but I really appreciate two or three of them that I'd like to share with you. Philippians 2.4 uh, talks about the importance of taking an interest in others. That's encouragement. Or how about Hebrews 10.24 that says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Again, encouragement. Or Romans 15.2 that says, we should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. Sounds like encouragement to me. So I guess to wrap up this podcast today, I'd like to encourage you to look around yourself, look at your friends, your family, coworkers, or even strangers around you. How can you be an encourager to them? How can you change your responses in social media to be encouraging? 
What kinds of things can you do to be the encouragement in our world that it is so desperately needing? As always, thanks for joining me for this conversation today. I am grateful that we get to spend this time together each week hearing stories of God's amazing faithfulness. As a regular listener to this podcast, would you mind taking a few minutes and rating it on your favorite podcast app? Reviews and ratings really help spread the word so that other folks can hear about these great conversations. And if you have comments or questions for me, please feel free to drop me a message on any of the social media platforms. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon by searching for at CCM Exchange. Or you can always drop me an email on the website christianmusicarchive.com. I'm really looking forward to our time together next week when I have another great conversation with one of the musicians you'll find on the pages of the Christian Music Archive. So until then, remember this. God loves you. In fact, he's crazy about you. <laughs>